this month on In The Life. I grew up with really strong messages of what a proper woman is supposed to be like in an Islamic family. They don't look at me as a woman or somebody that they perceive as small. They're just like, that's a cool adventure, go. Any of the people that she was exhibiting for and selling to would have known perfectly well what these works were about. All this and more on America's Gay and Lesbian News Magazine. In the Life is funded in part by the H. Van Ameringen Foundation. Additional support provided by the Ford Foundation and by the Gill Foundation, and by the New Pole Foundation, and by the annual support of In The Life members like you. Welcome to In The Life. I am Martina Navratilova, and I'm excited to host this evening's program. Tonight, in honor of Women's History Month, In The Life returns to its archives to celebrate the lives and accomplishments of several extraordinary women. Our first story takes us to Paris, France, in the early years of the 20th century. You're about to meet an American expatriate painter, Romaine Brooks, who dared to be different. And today, almost a century later, her work continues to challenge our notions of female sexuality and identity. Romaine Brooks is a really landmark figure in the development of gay art and gay lesbian consciousness because she was the first artist to really deal with lesbian life and personalities as her primary subject matter. Any woman at that period of time who would go out of her way by choice to paint lesbian subjects, bisexual subjects, uh, would have been extraordinary in any art historical context. The idea of a, of, of a kind of visible lesbian identity was really emerging for the first time within mainstream culture. This is an absolutely unique opportunity to see the work of Romaine Brooks. This exhibition is put together not only with the works from the Smithsonian American Museum of Art, but from seven museums, I believe, in France. A retrospective right now of her work is very important because there has been a real transformation in the way we understand pictures and artworks to operate historically so that a show now as opposed to say 30 years ago will focus not only on um, the artist's aesthetic achievement but also will think about the way the images say particular things about people or about the culture that they were produced in. Romaine Brooks lived in the lesbian capital of the early 20th century. She was in Paris. She knew everybody who was anybody. And in Paris at that time, women, and especially lesbian women, really dominated the cultural scene. Uh, there were two rival salons, groups of people that gathered for cultural exchange and so forth. And one circled around Brooks and her lover, Natalie Barney, who was a writer, and the other circled around Gertrude Stein and her lover, Alice Toklas. It was the first period and the first place where fairly openly gay people could have some kind of cultural life of their own and have a real impact. Her work focuses almost exclusively on women. And um, at the same time, there are several images that, I, that are distinctly about trying to visualize uh, a lesbian identity. Brooks's portrait of Una Trubridge is one that she actually referred to in a letter as a sign of the age to amuse some future feminists. She really was particularly interested in how these paintings reflected a certain idea about her contemporary culture. So that, for example, the short hair of uh, Una Trubridge is an incredibly fashionable way for women to bob their hair. 
and also the sort of the I think deliberately emphasized um, made up lips and the the very prominent pearl earrings all in some ways almost exaggerate a sense of femininity and then that's placed in contrast with the kind of severe tailoring and the very binding cravat this image of Peter a young English girl that um, has a real gentleness and sensitivity to the sitter's personality um, and a real quietness um, to the portrait itself that is somewhat, I think, at odds with what the contemporary audience would have seen as um, the somewhat shocking nature of her, the fact that she's wearing a man's suit. What's unique about Brooks is that any of the people that she was exhibiting for and selling to would have known perfectly well what these works were about because she made portraits of her lovers, she made portraits of well-known lesbian personalities and sold them to those people and exhibited them as such. I do think that there was a segment of her viewership that would also have understood these as particular strategies that uh, lesbian women were adopting at that time to, in some ways, recognize one another in culture. This painting is, in some ways, the, the key image to her work, in particular because it's a self-portrait. It's very much about her creating a, a public identity for herself. I think her 1923 self-portrait is probably the lesbian icon, you know, of the modernist period, so to speak, because it presents such a positive image, such a self-contained image, such a stylish image. I saw it as an extraordinary, forceful, compelling, cruisy portrait. With this more or less androgynous appearance, she's reflecting um, changes in um, you know, women's identity associated with the idea of the modern woman, a sort of early idea of female liberation. This is a painting called Spring from 1912, and it's also uh, one of the images for which Ayad Rubinstein, the Russian dancer, was the model. And it was painted while the two of them were involved in a personal relationship between 1911 and 1914. Most of her nude work that she did is centered around Ida Rubinstein. And I think Ida Rubinstein became a kind of physical ideal for her exploration of the female nude. There was a relatively concentrated period where she was thinking about the subject of the female nude. And what's interesting about it is that was still a fairly controversial subject for a female artist to paint. And she definitely did not back away from that controversy. This motif of the white azaleas is one that was specifically associated with Romaine Brooks's work as an interior designer. So in a sense, what Romaine Brooks has done is identify this space that this nude female figure is in as her own living space. And there, I think, she's definitely trying to force a recognition of this erotic connection between her as the artist and this female nude as the model. And this painting called The Crossing, in which, for all intents and purposes, Ida Rubinstein is shown as a dead woman. But she retains that sense of the almost icy eroticism of Ida Rubinstein's figure. There were certain limits on being a female artist at the turn of the century, and what she does is press those limits and change those limits. And I think, in part, her own personal sexuality is what uh, motivated her to really test those boundaries and to try to revise them. In the last 30 years, we've had a whole development of gay and lesbian cultural theory that lets us see what the connections might be between art and life. And in her case, uh, the connections are very powerful. The exhibition itself is a huge change. I mean, in the 80s, you couldn't do what has been done today in terms of talking about Romaine as a lesbian, putting up place cards with information saying, lesbian, lesbian, lesbian. The L word was just not to be used. Now it's out, and it gives us an opportunity to look at our history as gays and lesbians and bisexuals and to look at how people presented themselves, how their identities, as it were, were shaped and formed and matured. 
the idea of gay and lesbian identity has been somewhat erased from the historical record. The idea of, in a sense, rewriting history to include that um, is something that's important to a lot of scholars. So it is a very rare opportunity to see Romaine Brooks in her entirety and in this manner. The uh, exhibition will travel to the California Berkeley Museum of Art, and after that it will go back to all of its owners. Tucked away in an old brownstone in Brooklyn, New York, is a rare collection of once forgotten lesbian histories. For the past 32 years, the volunteer caretakers of this archive have gathered rich and colorful stories that celebrate the very diverse lesbian community. We began talking about how easily our history had gotten lost. That we didn't want our story to be told by, quote, a patriarchal history keeper. I didn't want our story to be told by those who called us freaks to begin with. If we didn't do it, nobody was going to do it for us. This wasn't going to be a one-night stand. <laughs> it was going to be a long-term relationship. We had a commitment to the archives that, one, it had to be a lifelong commitment, because just think, if an archives doesn't outlast at least one generation, it's not an archives. So it started in a back room. And my mother was living here at the time. And it was this, we'd have these meetings around the table. My mother would come out without her teeth in, and she'd say, very good, girls, very good. <laughs> if it's done by a lesbian, we collect it. If it's thought about by a lesbian, we collect it. If it's written by a lesbian, if it's touched by a lesbian, we, we collect it. We have papers and diaries and journals. We have photographs. Traditional archives have been about famous people. And from the beginning, that was not our view, that this was an archive that belonged to the people who lived its history. In the life of Mabel Hampton, which is, for me, at the spiritual heart of the archives, captures that. Because in traditional history, Mabel Hampton's story would not be told. She was a domestic worker for most of her life. She was an entertainer. She was a participant in the Harlem Renaissance. And I know Miss Hampton, and this is harder for me to talk about. At one point, Miss Hampton worked for my mother, and that's how I met her. And she was the first lesbian woman I ever knew. And the courage this woman had, as you would, you would ask Mabel later in life, when she was here with the archives and she was living here, women would make pilgrimages to see her on Thursday night, and they'd sit at her feet. And she was, she she loved the ladies, she loved the girls, as she called them. And they'd say, "Well, Mabel, when were you? When did you come out?" And she'd say, "What do you mean? When did I come out? I was never in." A few years ago, my lover then found a T-shirt, and the T-shirt was about famous black women in history, and it listed all the famous women, Sojourner Truth, and the last name on that list was Mabel Hampton. You know, so in her 80s, she became this really out gay activist. In 1991, after years of planning and fundraising, the Lesbian Her Story Archives bought this building in Brooklyn, New York. We did a lot, as a group, a lot of fundraising um, in order to get this building. We had people giving us small donations, and we were able to put down half of the building, really, um, half of the cost of the building at the time of purchase from donations, 99% of which were 25, 55, Eventually, those small donations enabled the archives to pay off the entire mortgage. That was a very exciting moment for us, to really realize that we could claim the mortgage, tear up the mortgage, and not be beholden to any bank um, or any outside group that this was our building, the lesbian community's building. Here we are on the first floor in the parlor, and the books and materials that we have in this room really represent um, the most traditional sort of library. We have a vast collection of subject files ranging everything from newsprint to um, pamphlets to flyers about lesbian activities and events. 
And then over here we have a very special collection. This we call the Red Dot Collection. It was the library of the New York City chapter of the Daughters of Belitis. And it really represents what lesbians were reading in the 1960s, 1950s and 60s, and it's a wonderful collection. That's the Lesbian Survival Collection. They're a wonderful collection of paperbacks from the 50s and 60s. And I had read them myself when I came out in the 50s. That was all there was. And they were read all over this country. In fact, they were bestsellers. These were the secreted books. Some of them were very powerful. They were handbooks on how to survive as a lesbian woman. Women who wrote under assumed names and women who wrote using their own names, they had absolutely no control of the text, the title, or the content. If there was a sex scene between two women, a woman had to lose her child, her job, or die. So we read around the markings of hatred and control and found remarkable things. Here we are in the dining room. We use it for exhibits. We have tapes, photography, flat art, posters, graphics, and an extensive videotape collection. The archives is run by a coordinating committee. We meet every three weeks. And we all sign up on the calendar for the days we're actually going to staff and be here. We don't have any paid staff. We don't have any plans at this point to have paid staff. We are part of the community, and it's our community who will um, keep us going. And it's absolutely paid off. We had decided early on that the Lesbian History Archives would not be what we call a role model collection, meaning that we wanted the stories of all lesbian women. And if they were sex workers, we wanted that story. And if they were S&M women, we wanted that story. All of this got even more complex when just a few years ago, maybe two or three years ago, we got the collection of a woman, a lesbian woman, who had been an FBI informant in the 50s, informing on labor movement groups. A woman who had spent much of her later life in Provincetown ran one of the most famous lesbian tourist spots in Provincetown and was very loved by that community and her past very little known. And I remember one woman saying to me, a very fervent woman saying, well, well, if there was a lesbian Nazi group, you wouldn't want their papers. And I, as a Jew, saying, we certainly would. One, we, have, we need to understand. You know, it's, it's an uncomfortable collection, but it's important. The next story takes us to the Vermont countryside, where an innovative cartoonist, Alison Begdell, lets her imagination run wild. Inspired by her own experiences as a lesbian, Begdell creates a gallery of authentic and unforgettable characters. My strip is not a defense or an explanation of lesbianism. Or it's, that's like the ground. That's what I take for granted. And, and the character's experience is normative. Alison Bechtel is a university arts graduate who grew up one of three siblings in a Pennsylvania farm town. She has lived in places as varied as New York City, Minneapolis, and Northampton, Massachusetts. But for the past nine years, she calls rural Vermont home, where she shares her life with her partner, Amy. We've been together almost eight years. She's trained as a playwright, so she's really helped me a lot with my work. How to dramatize it, how to make the stories more gripping. She's sort of my director. I started drawing when most kids start drawing, which is like immediately, I mean, as soon as you can hold a pencil. And I just never stopped. I started drawing these lesbians, these kind of wacky little drawings in in the margin of uh, letters to a friend of mine from college. I called the first one, Dykes to Watch Out For, plate number 27, as if, you know, I had 26 other of these drawings, which of course I didn't. But I, that concept of a series really kind of interested me, and I started doing more and more of them. 
I heard about Alison Bechdel in a store not very dissimilar from this one, um, the women's bookstore in New York back in the early 1980s. The owner of that bookstore said, you really need to read the local newspaper, the women's rag, because there's this great cartoonist that comes out every now and then, and her work is hysterical, and you'll love it. Like, one of my very first fan letters was from this woman, Nancy Biriano, and uh, she asked me if I was interested in doing a book. And the book came out in 86. And I've stayed with Firebrand ever since. We've done, I think, 10 books altogether now. I hate trying to reduce the characters to a single sentence because I work so hard at creating these complex, um, three-dimensional people. But um, basically the characters are all different aspects of my own personality. Yes, my characters are probably a little, a tad more diverse than the average community in this country, but I think that's important. I know what it felt like to me growing up as a lesbian and never seeing my, myself represented anywhere. I know how much it means to people to, to see themselves. Mo's sort of the central character in this strip. Of all the characters, she's probably the most me. Sydney is this, she's the evil women's studies professor. Sydney is Mo's girlfriend. Clarice and Tony, they've been together for almost 20 years. At this point, they have a son, and they're like this really stable pair in the community. And then over, I have this a whole other bunch of characters, um, this sort of group household where Ginger and Lois and Sparrow and Stuart live. It used to be just Ginger and Lois and Sparrow, but then Sparrow got involved with this man, Stuart. And there's been a lot of uh, sexual identity upheavals going on at their house. Look, in a perfect world, I wouldn't have to call myself anything. But for now, Bi Dyke works for me, okay? I think I'm a butch lesbian in a straight man's body. Soft butch? Maybe. She just has an uncanny ability to create a distinct cast of people, to give each person a distinct physique and personal history. It's one of the hardest things about creating a serial strip, is uh, creating more than one person who doesn't sound exactly like you. One of its weaknesses is also one of its strengths. Allison has always been very good about integrating politics and social issues into the strip. Well, after I moved to Vermont, I really started to worry, like, how am I going to keep up with things? Because it's really very quiet here. And so I read a lot. I get, you know, I get, like, a stack like that of gay and lesbian newspapers every month. Um, I get lots of other magazines and newspapers. And uh, But the, the Internet has been my savior. I used to do this all the time before I could afford Polaroid film. Um, I'd just look in the mirror and pose myself. So all the characters, they really do look like me, like they have my hands and move like me. I think Allison has created a tradition of presenting unusual multifaceted portraits of, of women in comics, portraits of women who are intelligent and have a sexiness all of their own. Changing your body to conform to a rigid, conventional gender identity is just more binary thinking. What was wrong with being a butch dyke? He doesn't feel like a butch dyke. He feels like a gay man. Oh my God, Geraldine from Rainbow Automotive? I used to have such a thing for her. I mean him. I mean... Don't get too excited, Stu. He goes more for the stud horse type. To me, success has been the fact that I'm earning my living at this, you know, that I really get to keep doing it every day. And that's all the success I could hope for. Well, that and a Pulitzer Prize. <laughs> she was approached by Universal Press Syndicate, which is one of the major newspaper syndicates in the country, about originating a strip for them. It's not that they wanted to syndicate Dykes to watch out for. They wanted to syndicate a much more sort of cleaned up kind of cartoon strip. She turned them down like I need to add that. <laughs> Somehow being a lesbian saved me from going over to the dark side. <laughs> Because, you know, I grew up, I was just this kind of average, oblivious, white, middle-class American kid. I didn't know how the world worked. I didn't know what was really going on. And it was only after I realized I was a lesbian and, and I was suddenly outside of that little comfortable system that I was able to see it. I was able to see how it worked and what the nasty underpinnings of everything 
really were. She does a phenomenal job of identifying the comedy and the tragedy in situations that gay and straight people can identify with across the board. Allison's trick is to originate all these discussions within a queer framework, but she does it with a very universal touch. I used to say I, I just I write for lesbians and gay men and that's all I really care about, but in truth, I've always wanted other people to read my work. But I don't want to have to sacrifice the authenticity of the characters who I write about. I don't think she's uh, necessarily assimilated her cartoons. I would almost argue that society has sort of assimilated around them. I just read an interesting review of my work. It was talking about how lesbianism is becoming mainstream and assimilated, and that I don't mainstream lesbianism, rather I dyke-stream heterosexuality. And that's going to be my new motto. The stark, icy landscape of Antarctica has captured the imagination of explorers for hundreds of years. You're about to meet two remarkable women, Anne Bancroft and Leif Arneson, who absolutely shatter the notion that women are too fragile to endure polar exploration. On November 13, 2000, Bancroft and expedition partner Leif Arneson set out to break a world record as the first women to cross Antarctica on foot. The two women used skis, cleats, and sails to make their way across this forbidding and foreign landscape. They pulled sleds that weighed 250 pounds full of food and equipment and endured temperatures as low as 30 degrees below zero with winds gusting up to 100 miles per hour. They made history 94 days and 1,717 miles later. Anne and Leave shot this remarkable video footage themselves. Being on this trip and, and trying to describe it is uh, what we saw and what we felt seeing all of that is really hard because um, in, in 97 days, we saw so much variety. Most people think it's a blue, white, boring, flat place but we travel on glaciers. The plateau is different than the glaciers. The construction of the snow or the makeup of the snow and ice is different every day. The lighting is so astounding. It's changing during the day. And when that lighting changes in such an enormous place, when you're this little speck, it changes your whole surroundings. An extraordinary day was Christmas Day, and we had been hoping to sail. It was snowing on and off, which is very unusual in Antarctica. And uh, so it was very hard to distinguish what was ground and what was sky. It was, you know, enshrouding us. The wind picked up in the afternoon, and we got so excited that we packed up everything within uh, 40 minutes, I think. And we were hooked into our sails, and we started to sail, but it was still the whiteout. And then the sun came out and burst through some of that white. And uh, it, was, it was magic. However, not every day was Christmas. Some days were extraordinarily difficult. Their fingers and noses were numb from frostbite, and the terrain was often treacherous. When we started the trip, and we were going up the glacier, and, and the snow was quite deep, and our sleds were 267 pounds. You know, and I'm weighing in at, at uh, 130. You know, that's, it was hard. Uh, and you think, how am I going to do this? You have these moments of, you know, what I call the heart thumpers, and you realize that you're extremely isolated. So, you know, we got into very difficult areas, and we, you know, would come back and we'd say, yeah, if we did get hurt here, it would be very hard to get rescued. I mean, you recognize those kinds of things. This was Anne and Leif's first expedition together. These two women, one lesbian and one straight, grew up on separate continents but they shared a childhood dream of growing up to be explorers. Day 74. Dang. Eight day, the eighth day without wind. And we pull. Oh, we have the pulling, it's hard. I think it took me only a day or two that I really felt that we were sister spirits or sister souls because we had this kind of common uh, experience from the kids. I was reading the same books in Oslo like Anne did in St. Paul. We just got to know each other two and a half years ago. And um, uh, Liv 
wrote me in 1993. I had just returned from Antarctica. She was about to embark on a solo expedition, very similar route to the one we had just completed, and was interested in um, knowing about wind direction, et cetera, for a variety of reasons. Just you talk to everybody you can before you go. Um, and I knew I wanted to return to this remarkable continent. So I sort of stuffed her number away and I thought, I need to meet this woman for one reason or another. One, because I want to perhaps travel with her. If she's crazy enough to go by herself, that's just what I'm looking for. Well, I didn't know uh, that Anne was a lesbian before I actually came into her house and Pam. And, and I met Pam. And, uh, but, but by then, uh, I had met her, I talked to her, and uh, we had exchanged mail or, or, or letters. So I had, I had a positive feeling. And to me, it was more important uh, that she had a good relationship with her partner than that, that she actually was a lesbian. Because going on an expedition like that, it's kind of uh, can, can affect the expedition if the person you go with uh, has a bad relationship. She has a good sense of humor, and it's fun to be with her. And uh, some days was really depressing. Uh, the wind did not come, and we had uh, to work hard to pull the sledges. And we said to ourselves that we're, today I'm depressed. So we put up the video camera and put up our mouth harps and made some jokes. We don't talk a lot on these journeys. We've got face masks on, the wind is blowing, we're in single file. You're exhausted. Uh, they're not elements that are conducive to conversation anyway. And it's, it's a long, long journey. So I always say that we have lots of friends that we climb and kayak with and do outdoor endeavors that are very skilled. But they're very clear that they don't have the personality to go on a 100-day expedition. And we do. We, we revel in the fact that we will have this time away. It feels like a privilege to us. And in fact, the time went very fast. Preparing for a trip like this is grueling work. In addition to securing endorsements, getting supplies, and testing equipment, there is the physical aspect of the training, which takes each woman up to six hours a day. In the warmer months, when there's no snow on the ground, Anne runs for two to four hours, dragging tires to simulate the weight of her sled. The outdoors is her gym. She strengthens and tones by chopping all of the wood she uses to heat her house, and by canoeing in a nearby river. As former school teachers, both Bancroft and Arneson are dedicated to using their adventures to inspire young people, and girls especially, to follow their dreams. They are working in partnership with schools and educators to bring the lessons of their journeys to a global classroom through the internet. I used to be an elementary school teacher and a high school coach. In 85, when I uh, was chosen to go on an expedition to the North Pole, I took a sabbatical, and that sabbatical has extended to now. So uh, I, I never returned to the formal classroom, in part because I realized that I could do these expeditions and still be a teacher. My classroom would just be a bit broader and uh, have more flexibility. My kids would be not just my 30 kids. They would be uh, classrooms all over the country and then now uh, in a global setting. Sandra, Leslie, please. No, this is Anne. When we were on the ice, we communicated through a satellite phone. Every day we would give a report, which then went on the website, utilizing our voices. I mean, it's just phenomenal the way in which we could be so remote and still feel very um, intimate with our audience and have such a large audience. This has been a life process, and concretely, it's been 11 years in planning the Traverse, so I have needed positive voices, whether it's coming from my partner Pam, whether it's coming from what I call my inner circle of really good friends that, that knows me, uh, and sometimes it comes from kids because kids are still so optimistic. They don't look at me as a woman or somebody that they perceive as small. They're just like, that's a cool adventure, go. And I can get energized by that. This month, 
and Bancroft and Leif Arneson will begin their latest expedition to trek across the Arctic Ocean. They will soon rendezvous with a scientific team who are studying the impact of global warming. The first TV series to feature the stories of lesbian lives, The L Word, broke new ground and immediately developed a diverse audience when it premiered in January 2004. Two years ago, In the Life went behind the scenes to meet the show's creator and talented ensemble of actors who continue to shatter stereotypes. I sat down with a couple of executives and I said, I know this is kind of a crazy idea, but I just think we should do a lesbian ensemble drama. And they kind of looked at me um, and concurred that it was a crazy idea. I didn't have any representation of, of somebody gay on TV, so I would go into this sort of fantasy world when I watched television. For instance, Facts of Life, I, I really thought that Joe and Blair like had something special going on. It just goes to show that when you're left with nothing, you have to sort of make do. I have some recollection of them saying, I don't think that we could ever sell this to the suits upstairs. All in the course of a season, everything that was supposed to happen happened. They ordered my script. We went forward, we cast the show, um, which was really challenging. You know, all these actors have agreed to play these gay characters. Ed, I don't know why that's such a taboo, because a lot of people do it. Uh, but with regards to women, Again, there hasn't been a show where every female character is gay. I think the straight world is starting to come out of its closet and say, OK, here's the deal. These are my friends. These are my brothers, my sisters, my parents. These are people that I care about. And I want to see my world reflected in, in my entertainment. And it hasn't been. I went to Showtime as opposed to a network because I wanted to be free to tell these stories as I felt they needed to be told. I wanted to be frank, especially about sex and sexuality, because that's really the theme of the show. Come on, help me out here. You know I mean it. One of my best friends, they didn't know what was wrong with her. Wrong. She was normal. She was gay. We couldn't be friends because I was black and she was white. I got a note from her later on saying she was sorry that we didn't get to have a friendship while we were growing up with little girls. The gay and lesbian world really kept my career and what I had done in the past totally out in the open. They were so supportive because they believed art doesn't retire and go away. I don't understand. I'm pregnant. <laughs> and you're happy about that? Of course. Daddy. We haven't really come that far when you think about it, you know what I mean? At least I feel, you know, as a society in terms of just accepting homosexuality, I feel like we've gotten better, you know, as a nation, but have we really when there are just still discriminatory things that happen every day? You are just so gay. So gay. I know. I know. I thought that I understood uh, gay issues, and I thought I, ah, I was totally in tune. I had no clue. I, you know, and I realize now it's sort of like the minute you start to learn about something, you realize how little you know. I think in America, I think it's probably really important, especially with, especially with the state of things as they are now, becoming more and more conservative as you watch um, the way the politics is going. I mean, who knows what's going to, what the situation is going to be by the time this airs. Um, but yeah, I think it's very important here and I think it, it's necessary. This kind of drama is definitely necessary. So you make the one? With it comes an audience who may not have a good comprehension of the gay and lesbian world, which is what I want, what I would love to have for them to come and learn. As a straight woman to play a gay character. It's very interesting how other people react to you. I have a secret. What? I've never actually attended a parade. A lot of parade. my male friends think it's the most exciting thing ever, which is kind of odd and I'm a bit disappointed in them, I have to say, because they all find it like, oh, really, you're gonna get, you're gonna get like together with other women and we're gonna be able to watch it on TV? And it's like, that's obviously what the L word is up against. I always considered myself bisexual from the minute I was 16. I said that in interviews, I said it to the advocate. I've made a commitment. 
it's to a man. <laughs> if you want to call me heterosexual, fine. I don't really call myself anything now but married. <laughs> I paid any attention. Yeah, but you guys, she's got nine in the less column and she only has seven in the straight. Yeah, but the margin of error is plus or minus five percentage points. Are we to say that I shouldn't play Tina because I'm married? But what if I was the only one in the room that nailed it? Didn't I win that part? There's always shame. Guys, hey. hey. You know, someone like Mia or Kate or anyone else, what if they don't want to ever comment on their sexuality? Or what if they change their mind? It's when somebody kind of invades your personal space. It's you come out, you know, to do these things, you're promoting a show, you're promoting a job that you did to get people interested and invested in it and to promote it. And of course, you know, there's a, people want to know about who you are in real life, but of course, like, there's an element of respect when it comes to that because I don't bring my personal life on that screen. No, what? no, no, look, it's cool. I totally dig the need to make a living. I'm meeting a client anyway. I get it as a political argument. I get it. I get it that it might be frustrating to some people in the community, but it just goes right back to, can't we just celebrate the show? Shouldn't we just celebrate the show? Apple 18, Charlie D. White. I've done scenes before with men, actors, and they push it, and they know they're pushing it. The director will call cut, and they will continue doing what they're doing. And it's like, you know, we've cut now, you can unhand me. You're not going to get that with um, on set, working with other women. When it comes to the sex part of it all, you just kind of got to, as the straight girl, you got to ask questions. And, and thank God I work with open-minded people that have no problems expressing, like, well, a woman's clitoris, you know what I mean? And you just go for it. <laughs> yes, we get to tell the truth on people. <laughs> the funniest thing to me is that um, a lot of straight girls come up to me and they sort of whisper to me that they like the show. They're like, I really like the show. And they're like sitting next to their boyfriend. <laughs> like they're not allowed or something. <laughs> I think we had some criticism earlier for like, oh, we're too lipstick, it's too polished, it's too glammy. I mean, I'm from New York, so I mean, I had tons of friends in New York, um, you know, gay and straight, that'd be like, you guys just started way too polished. <laughs> I do get a lot of flack sometimes with you, well, you know, you're not representing this person, you're not representing that person, and um, it's true, but we are representing this particular group of people. If I saw, saw the big picture of, of the weight, the burden that we have, I think I wouldn't, wouldn't leave my house. I'd live in the barn and just stay there and let, let my hair grow nappy. And obviously, I understand there's political things behind it, but sometimes you have to just step away and step outside of the box. I don't think the cast of Friends is necessarily representative of Manhattan, um, but it's kind of hard to represent an entire city on one sitcom, let alone an entire community of people on one show. Being the first of its kind, um, there is so much pressure to get it right, and there are always going to be people who think we don't get it right, but we get it right for this group. The big difference for us this season is that we're better filmmakers. The actors have really deepened their characters. <laughs> it's great, now the two of you can be together. We hang out with each other all the time, and we talk about our scenes, and we talk about the scripts, and we talk about our characters, and we talk about how to make things better, or, you know, uh, how to make it more real. And cut. <laughs> The writers know their material better. We worked with great filmmakers, and our crew have honed their kind of systems for, for getting the work done. It's not like working on another cop show or something. It's just, it's, it has so much meaning behind it. And I am so proud to be a part of something like that. It's funny, doing what I'm doing now, being on this show and, and being wait, wait, sort of difference? this kind of role model is better than anything I probably expected to get out of my career. Television is the venue in which we get to talk about our lives at large. And we get to keep on saying it because our stories don't end. Television is the perfect medium for that. Everything we do in life should be on television and should be analyzed how well we're doing, where it was, where it is, and where it's going. It's a beginning, it's a celebration, I think, of this show is here, it's about time. 
And what I hope is that we just keep on telling great stories. Remember everybody as if they're looking at the parade. It is rarely easy for those in the gay community to reconcile their sexuality with their religious beliefs. Tonight, you will meet four lesbians of the Muslim faith who struggle to understand the contradictions between their deep belief and the innate reality of their being. My name is Dang. I grew up in the Philippines. Pass on the word that um, Middle Eastern lesbians do this despite the... I was born in Iran. I came here with my family when I was really young. My name is Aruj. I grew up in Karachi, Pakistan. I was born in Palestine. I grew up there. I came to the U.S. a few years ago, and I was raised as a Muslim. I grew up with really strong messages of what a proper woman is supposed to be like in an Islamic family. Issues around sexuality, chastity, the way a woman should dress, the way a woman should carry herself in public were deeply ingrained into my psyche from a really young age. I was always told that, you know, this is how a Muslim woman behaves or this is what a Muslim woman does. And this is what I grew up on. Coming out was the worst experience I've ever gone through throughout my life. I was too scared to face myself and confront my feelings for women because I was terrified of losing what I have. I had so much at risk. I didn't know how to deal with my daughter and what if I come out, I'm, I'm gonna lose her and lose my husband, I'm gonna lose my life. It was very painful. I had huge amounts of conflict. I felt like I was betraying my community, I was betraying God, I was betraying my parents specifically, and um, I was totally closeted. So it, there was no one for me to turn to. I didn't feel like I could go to anyone in the Islamic community for help. It just boils down to like, you know, I am still what I am, no matter how hard I try to change it. Of course, if I want to be a true Muslim, I would not even think of being with another woman. It really impacts people in this way that, you know, how dare you claim your body? How, you know, because women's bodies are subject to a lot of policing. And so if you're saying you're a queer woman, you, you know, you're right there, you're saying, I, I have the right to do what I need to do to my body. You know, this is my body. My growing up, I really, you know, felt that, you know, my body was not my body. Living within a non-Muslim dominant culture with different views of gender and sexuality, creates additional conflicts. There is this kind of like individual autonomy over your own body. It's an idea that gets constructed that doesn't exist. It actually does not exist in many parts of the world, including the Islamic world. I know where I come from. There isn't such a thing. I mean, nobody, very few people would argue that it is the woman's right to have, um, to have or not to have children. A lot of people have to be involved in it. The relationship are assumed to be relational people's relationship to each other. It's not individually based, it's more collectively based. For many Muslim women, coming to terms with their sexual identity means having to turn away from Islam. I do believe in Allah, and so kind of to give that up, that was hard, but I just could not do both things at the same time. It was too much. I really couldn't deal with the, the disparities in my life, and so I think I just kind of let go of Islam. I still struggle with how I can be Muslim and practice the religion, but also be true to my sexuality. It's such a contradiction, and it's been years since I've felt like praying five times a day or doing the fasting during Ramadan because I still feel like it's pointless. Like, what's the point of doing all that if technically I'm gonna to go to hell anyway for being gay? It becomes really difficult for gays and, Muslim, and, and lesbian Muslims in particular to figure out what their identity is all about. And this is the problematic of how do I identify as gay or lesbian Muslim? There is no way I can be both. I was very depressed since August of last year. And what helped me most is prayers. I just cried to him and he helped me. And I feel like I, you know, I get the blessings. Every time I pray, I get the blessings, you know. I am still here and I still have my sanity, thank God. But I have thought of like maybe 
it's time for um, change. You know, maybe this is not the kind of life that, you know, he wants for me. How do we think of all the parts of ourselves are not being at, a, at conflict with each other? Because we don't think they're at conflict with each other, but the world does. In my research, I actually have found that in the Quran itself, in the, the holy book, there isn't a verse that prohibits same-sex practices. There's a lot of arguments about what it really says about homosexuality, because the way that the Quran talks about homosexuality, it's really specifically talking about a group of men who had wives and children who were basically having orgies. So that is the context in which homosexuality is discussed. Islam, as anything else, can be interpreted for all sorts of reasons. So you can interpret it in order for, for, for positive social change or for negative social change. You can interpret them as, as, as you will. Dang's own studies of the Quran have led her to a verse called Yasin. For her, these words acknowledge and validate her existence. Glory be to him who created all the sexual pairs of that which the earth groweth and of themselves and of that which they know not. Besides religion and sexual identity, these women also struggle with the racism that still exists in American culture. You're in a country where being queer is predominantly accepted and you can live your life, so you have a lot of love for America because it gives you freedom. But at the same time, the same world right now is being really unfair to your people, you know, from the Middle East. The first year that I was here in America, I was in high school and I was living at home in the suburbs of Chicago. I remember stuff like one a teacher asking me if he can call me Packy because there was no way that, you know, he could, and, you know, like people had a lot of issues pronouncing my name. And looking back, I know it was wrong. You know, obviously it was racist, it was wrong. But at that time, I had no concept. At the Dyke March, it was a very interesting experience because throughout the march, I was waving my Palestinian flag and I saw so much support from women who passed by me and they would just cheer, yeah, go Palestine. And I was walking with a Palestinian friend of mine and someone just bumped into me and knocked down my flag that I had attached to my knapsack. And then when I looked, I saw my, my flag on the ground and I looked at her like, what did you do? And, and she just looked at me with this ugly face and yelled, terrorist. It's very complicated being a Palestinian, Muslim, and Arab, and a lesbian, because within the mainstream lesbian community, I'm seen as the Palestinian. Either I'm the exotic Palestinian that they want to go out with, and they completely ignore the person in me, or I'm the terrorist. Since the events of 9-11, Muslims have received increased scrutiny. Before, we used to say we were so invisible, we wanted some visibility, and after 9-11, all of a sudden, it, would, it was much better being invisible. It was the best. We don't want this uh, visibility. So the visibility, the problem is the visibility did not come out as a positive development, came out as a very, very detrimental and destructive development. People like me are a threat to a lot of people, you know, whether it's mainstream America, whether it's um, mainstream Muslim communities or whatever. You know, you just never know who you're going to piss off. I don't want to be disrespectful of my religion. I'm in fear of God. I don't know if I should be talking to you, uh, you know, or in front of the camera about this. I just want to share to you a life of a um, Muslim woman, you know, and. Um, her struggles. I am still struggling. I feel like I have the privilege to be able to speak and, you know, I wanted to do that because I know there are a lot of people who can't. Also, for people out there who are, you know, queer Muslim women or women who are questioning the sexuality, I mean, you know, if they see this, if that makes them think like, wow, you know, like, you know, there are other people like me, I think that that's great. You really have to take on the conservative clerics and say you're not the only ones who own the truth to what Islam is all about. You are not the only ones who are going to interpret the word of God. We also, as God's children, are going to be able to interpret what the word of God is. And we're not going to let you get away with it. We're going to contest your definition. We're going to present different definition. Catches on. It's harder. It's a long struggle, but it has to be done, I think. I don't want to lie. I don't want to live two lives. I just want to be me. And I pray that the day will come when women like me 
would be accepted in, in the community because this is too much pain for me. I, I can't handle it anymore. I don't want to fake any, any feelings or anything. I don't want to make adjustments in my life like, like I've, I've done throughout my life. I missed out on so much because I had to fit within the heterosexual community and I don't want to do that anymore. I'm Martina Navratilova. For all of us at In The Life, thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next month. In the Life is funded in part by the H. Van Ameringen Foundation. Additional support provided by the Ford Foundation. And by the Gill Foundation. And by the New Pole Foundation. And by the annual support of In the Life members like you.